Welcome to the Pat Clone series of videos. This video is of a technical nature and is intended for technically minded individuals who are interested in programming on the Commodore 64. In the previous video I covered several bug fixes. This is the spoiler edition of the Pat Clone series. If you would prefer not to see the spoilers then stop playing this video right now. Since the release of the last video in the series I have had a death in the family. My dear 94 year old grandmother recently passed away. A side effect of this is that I have not been able to put as much work into the project as I would have liked. With that being said, I have still put together a terrific video for you to watch. I know I have called this video series Pac Clone, and really it is more of an homage to Pac Man, as well as a bit of a programming tutorial. I have taken some creative liberties, really just because I can, and why not? One of the largest differences has been instead of having intermissions in the game, I decided to instead replace them with challenge screens, which I will show off here in a minute. I have also implemented a sort of timer that changes the color of the dots after so long, as well as the point values you receive for them. One further spoiler is I have added a speed boost in the early levels, which is enabled after eating all four ghosts with one power pellet. I have come up with a name for the game and a backstory, which I would like to share with you now. I've decided to name the game G-Pack, Dementia Defender. Why? I wanted the game to have a theme and I was going for humor and this is a game that does not take itself too seriously. Here's the backstory. You play as G-Pack, a former MD who over the years has seen many, many cases of dementia through his practice. You have spent the majority of your life eating poorly, but now are on a health crusade. Fed up, you break into the world's largest nutritional center, the De Beers of Vitamin Factories, with the intent of collecting as many nutritional supplements and vitamin dots as possible. This is no simple task. Standing in your way are four of your internal demons materialized as GMOs, genetically modified organisms, HFCs, high fructose corn syrup, MSGs, monosodium glutamate, and BPAs, bisphenol A. Make your way through the many floors of this warehouse collecting as many Vita Dots and nutritional supplements as possible without succumbing to your demons. You start with five lives. You must act quickly because once the seal to the room is broken, the Vita Dots start to lose their nutritional value over time, costing you valuable points. Each room is stocked with five super antioxidant super pills which will temporarily repel your demons, sending them back to where they came from. Being a superhero is no easy job. Be smart, be brave, be swift, because that's what it will take to save the world from dementia. So that's my backstory. I know it's not the greatest, but it's what I'm going with. And let's take a look now at all of the level designs. So let's jump right into the maps here. And for the first time, I'll go through all of them and show them off here. First thing I want to do is load the character set so we get the right look. And then... So this is the first map. Really, there's only four maps with three challenge screens. And I don't I just call it map one down here. And then map two, this is the one that I designed and showed in a previous video with the straight lines, which I kind of like that look. And then map three, I, I all of these maps are subject to change, but I, I think they probably have too many dots on them, but and so I might go back and, and fix that at a later time and then map four in here. And the color scheme that you're seeing may not be exactly what the color scheme ends up being. Um, I don't particularly like these two combinations. And then I call this one maze craze. What you're not seeing is where the ghosts would be placed on, on the map. This is one of the challenge maps. So your challenge is to get through all of and eat all of the fruits and all of the dots without dying. If you die, you fail. If you survive, you are rewarded with a bonus. This is actually the third challenge screen. And I. this is the one that is, is an homage. And the lights are turned on right here. And uh, it's an homage to Adventure. This is the maze. So you get a quick peek here at the maze. Uh, but when you actually get to play the game, which I'll show here in, a, in an, a segment, in an upcoming segment, you will not see the full screen all at once. I called this one Carpal's Tunnel. And originally I had this all with lined with fruit. You had to eat and you start like right here. And then you go through. But I realized 
when you uh, put all fruit, it tells, it gives you the point value, you know, so if it's 800, 800, 800, so it takes forever, so I had to change them back to dots, and then I just put a few fruits here in the middle, and then I have sort of a homage to E.T. with, a, with the, uh, with the E.T. kind of symbols right there, but it's not really a, an homage, but it, it was kind of uh, coincidental, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm calling it an homage to E.T., the video game on Atari. And then I was working on sort of a screen when you start the game and, and with the G pack with with the start with the, the name of the game up at the top and then the name of the ghosts right here as described um, earlier. And then I was going to I was thinking about having it show the point values as you you know kind of a title screen that shows you know that they do on other other video games, but um, I'll show you here uh, what that looks like, what what I've done, which um, which is code that I've since abandoned, um, but not for very long. <laughs> I haven't started on anything else yet, but I'm going to abandon that code. But uh, here's what it looks like. So as you can see here, you had to hit the space bar to get Pat Clone to move. He's moving way too slow. The ghosts, I only have one implemented or one moving right now. And you, you see the flashing dot up here. This is supposed to be a, a power pill. They're supposed to be turned off. There's lots of little tweaks. The score shouldn't be there. It does show the scores like I was wanting it to. But then you have the issue when you eat the ghosts, they, they need to turn into the little eyes and that's not happening. And it's displaying the fruit here, which I, I would need to code around to get rid of that. So a lot of problems with that. Okay, and then the next screen this is the nearly finished product i'm not 100 percent sure with the color schemes and the point values here and uh i have a little video that i recorded of me actually building this and so so instead of doing the showing you actually eating the ghost and having the point values uh, sh be, be displayed as you eat the ghost i decided to display them this way and uh, to save time and headache because Doing it this way or the previous way in the in the segment I just showed it it was requiring a lot of tweaking to the existing code base and I was trying to use the the same code but it was it was requiring a lot of little tweaks that I didn't want to make and I got I got uh, tied up with other things real life <laughs> I had to keep first things first so I prefer this this uh, screen here to the other one okay here I'm showing a time lapse of me actually building the point the point screen and you'll have to bear with me it probably took me about 10 minutes to build this and you know you you, you agonize over every little thing on there the the color of each text item and and then you go through and you have to change I had to go back and change all the colors which almost show all the fruits going down the left side so it just took quite a, a bit of time to do this but um, it's it was sort of a, a, an in, it was I was enjoying the process. I'm experimenting with a way of displaying the backstory. I did a copy paste, and boy, that was <laughs> that uh, that doesn't look very good. So I'm still working on that's a future segment I need to work on, but. I got to figure out a way of displaying the text and formatting it properly and maybe having a, a, a space on the screen or maybe it displays the um, backstory when you first start the game and then you hit the space bar to skip it because you, you probably don't want to read it anyway or something along those lines to uh, um, add in. And then the final thing that I added in the game, um, this is that concludes the maps, was I was trying to work on an attract screen and I'll show you what I what I've got how far I've gotten with my attract screen right here. What you cannot see here is that I am not controlling the pack clone. He is moving 100% autonomously using a minor tweak to the code to substitute user input with a random direction selector used by the ghosts.
That's not too bad, right? I don't think it would take too long to have that fully implemented with the title screen and the attract screen. Next up, the joystick segment. Okay, in this segment I am going to be covering joystick input, how to attain input from the joystick, and how to implement it within the Paclone program. So I'm starting off with this nifty little website that has the Commodore 64 memory map. And I've covered it before, but it's really useful. It has all the different um, registers and everything that you could think of on, for the Commodore 64. And we'll search for joystick. And this is where I learned that joystick, the address DC00 or 56320 is what I need to be looking at when, uh, when regards to joystick port 2. And then if we want to look at joystick port 1, it's DC01. But I'm going to focus on port 2 because that's what most or a lot of um, programs use uh, on a lot of games and things use joystick port 2. Jumping into CBM, I have developed a quick little program to read in joystick port 2, 56320, and store it in the top left portion of the screen, 400 and then just jump in a loop. So let's run that. And you see when nothing is pressed there's just that little character and I gotta switch to joystick port 2. And if I push up I get character down, left, right. If I push corner characters. And then what I did was I went into the monitor and then looked at address 400 and then I wrote down all the values. For, so 7F is what the value for when nothing is being pressed on the keyboard, I mean on the joystick. And then I just wrote them all down for it. The values for up, down, left, right. Um, there's a value for up and left, up and right, down and left, down and right. And I'm not sure, I wasn't sure if I was going to need those values. So, And I just focused on up, down, left, right and the fire button. And then jumping into back to Pat Clone, I wanted to modify the area of code where the keyboard input was being, um, where the keyboard is being covered. So right here, uh, address FFE4, it reads in the value from the keyboard buffer, compares it to down. If it's down, go that way. If it's right, go that way. If it's left, go that way. If it's up, go that way. And it checks my uh, hidden key, or the T, which is my skip to the next level. And if it's none of those things, then it goes to no key was pressed. And this thing kind of loops. Now what I wanted, all I have to do is after it's done and no keyboard is pressed, all I have to do is check, instead of going here, I need to have it go to check the keyboard for uh, the, the joystick for input. And that's what I've done here in this version. So you see where it says no key pressed. I'm now saying check the joystick. So instead of no key pressed, check the joystick. And that's what this <clears throat> these few lines of code are right here. And I have a comment statement in here, which I can remove. So here we're reading in the value of DC00, comparing it to down, if it's not down, check up. If it's not up, check left. If it's not left, check right. And then all it's doing, if it is a, if it is down, for example, then it loads the value for, for the constant for down and then jumps up here, stores it in the user direction and returns. So that's all we have to do, this little program addition right here. And then there was one additional little thing and that was the very first time you do a keyboard input, I had modified Pat Clone so that it nothing happens until you push a key on the keyboard. So here it's reading in the keyboard buffer, checking if anything was pressed. If not, then it just jumps in a loop. So here it had to be modified slightly. So if there is nothing pressed on the keyboard, well, let's check the joystick. Was anything pressed on the joystick? 
if nothing was pressed on the joystick, then just keep looping until something was either pressed on the keyboard or joystick. If a key was pressed, then it jumps up here and does checks for which key was pressed. If a joystick button was pressed, then it, or if a joystick direction was pushed, then it checks right here, this section. And so, other than that, it just loops. So, I'm going to run the program, and let's test it out. And I'll show you how it works. Oops. It's going to look squarey. Okay, so right now it's writing for any key press. And default, I have Vice Emulator right now set to port 1. I'm going to hit Alt J to switch it to port 2. But I'm going to start the program by using the keyboard. I'm going to hit right. And I hope you can hear me pressing the buttons. So every time I move it every time I move a direction, the key the key you can hear me pressing the keys. Now I'm going to switch to joystick input. I'm not actually going to show the me um, using the joystick, but I'm going to switch to joystick. And so now I'm moving Pack Clone with the joystick. And to my delight, I'm only checking up, down, left, right. I don't have to check those corner key presses. It might make it a little smoother, but it seems to work pretty good without checking those corner, the up, left, or the down, right, or, or whatever. It seems to work without that. And so, with that, I'll uh, show I'll show one more. I'm going to skip up a level, and instead of starting with a key press, I'm going to start by pushing left on the joystick. So here you can see nothing happens until you do something. So I push left, and so I can either start the game with the keyboard or start the game with the joystick, and then I can control pack clone with the joystick now, or I can switch over and use keyboard. So uh, I know it's probably inefficient to use both, but for now that's that's what I have implemented and uh, I'm happy with it. I, it was very simple to, to do and it was probably took me less than an hour <laughs> to implement that. In this segment I am going to cover a technique that I'm using in the pack clone on one of the challenge screens have you ever wondered how in Adventure, when you go to the dungeon screens or the catacombs, how that was implemented? Well, sit back here for a minute and you're about to find out. So I've set up this uh, short little program here, which has some sprite data loaded and it's just going to load and turn on two sprites. So let's, let's take a look at that right now. So all I have to do is execute the program and it turns on the sprites right there and then I'm going to cover a couple of techniques we can use. So one of those techniques is, you see I have the square sprite, I want to use the double height and the double width options. So you can you could set any sprite to be a double height or a double width if you turn it on. And 53271 is for the height, and 53277 adjusts the width. And so I thought I would use this uh, as an example here with the square sprite with double height, double width. And then what you're not seeing here is that there's another sprite underneath this sprite. Let's uh, move it. Let's move the one on top. The X position. Let's move it over a little. So you can see I have the little, he's red, but he's normally yellow. And then there's one other feature here I wanted to, to point out. So now you have the sprite, you notice it's covering the text. Well, you, you don't want that for this. In order for this uh, effect to work, you have to uh, reverse that so that the text is on top of the sprite. And so in order, in order to do that, it's in position 53275. And if you enable that on, on, on that bit for that sprite, 
then the text appears in front. And you can kind of see where I'm going with this, right? So when we move 53248, if we move the sprite back over, we see it's covered up. And so this had stumbled me for a little bit. I was like, how do you reverse that so that the, the sprite underneath is, on, is above the sprite on top? In order to do that, I was looking at a, uh, a wiki page, uh, c64-wiki.com, and it says here, uh, in regards to the priority, that note that the priority amongst the sprites are on themselves are hardwired. A sprite with a lower number will always overlap or appear in front of a sprite with a higher number. And then, for example, sprite 3 will appear in front of sprite 5 should they happen to overlap. So that is the answer to that. So I had to go back to the program and rerun it, but reverse the sprites here. So I have, this is the first sprite. I'm gonna, I'm gonna instead of, uh, it's 145, and then the second sprite down here is 141. Well, I'm gonna make this one on the bottom 145, and this one on the top 141. That's basically the memory pointer to, to the sprites, to tell which uh, sprite that you're pointing to. And then we rerun re the program. Now you'll see that the sprite that was in the background is now on the top, but the colors are reversed. <laughs> you notice that, right? So if we do the height and the width thing again, 53271, comma 1. Oh, we can't do it with the, this is the wrong one. So we want to go instead of one, let's put that back to zero, and then we'll go five three two seven comma two instead of because we gotta set the second bit for the second sprite. And then for the width it's seven seven. And then now the only thing we have to do is well, there's a couple of things, but really all we really need to do is make the red, the big giant red sprite transparent or have the text behind it appear in front. And that is 53275. Oops. And there you have it. Now, if you position so that the little, the little sprite is in the center of that block, then you'll have the effect that I was going for that, that you see in Adventure and other, and other programs. So let's take a look at how I've actually implemented that in the Pack Clone game. So what you're seeing here is Challenge Map 3 in the Pack Clone game. And this is my homage to Adventure. And this is a very difficult level in the game and I actually had to make some modifications to the map to make it a little bit easier, but it is still difficult and uh, it's very enjoyable to, uh, to try to complete that map. So please be patient with me. I am working on this project as time permits. I'm using CBM Program Studio 3.8, and I believe Arthur Jordanson has recently released version 3.9, so go check that out. I intend to release the next video in the series in the January 2017 timeframe.